You know it. We know it. Next year is creeping up quick. If you want to win inside your niche in 2024, you need tech that puts you in the pilot seat. The new HubSpot Sales Hub will help you close out the year strong and kickstart your success for 2024. Teams can collaborate on every inch of the customer journey and keep operations running smoothly with a comprehensive prospecting workspace and powerful sales analytics tools that keep data connected across teams. They'll help you whip up assets and execute tasks that used to take hours out of your workday. HubSpot Sales Hub lets you accelerate every facet of your sales operation with precision. And with over 1,400 integrations, there are tons of ways to mix in new features. So finish out Q4 strong and gear up for the new year with HubSpot Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com slash sales. Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, November 13th. I'm Rob Litterst here with Ben Berkeley and Sarah Friedman. And this is the Hustle Daily Show. Our top story to start this week is a little dystopian. A recent survey of kids aged 8 to 12 found their top career choice was YouTuber. Now, to meet that demand, companies are founding children's camps that offer programming focused on content creation. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, let's catch up on everything else making headlines in the world of business and tech. First up, Bing, which is now rich with chat GPT features and riding a wave of hype, is still losing ground to Google, no surprise there. The search engine's U.S. market share dropped from 7.4% to 6.9% over last year. So this is super interesting because when ChatGPT launched, I feel like there was a ton of hype around Bing and this actually being Bing's moment. Ben and Sarah, do you guys ever use Bing? Have you ever used Bing? I'm so curious here. I have never and I will never. I think I'm totally a creature of habit when it comes to technology. And I also think most people are. I don't know. Ben, have you? I mean, I have felt wrong doing it. Like I felt like I was going against the grain and like I was trying to be too contrarian. It just didn't feel right. I mean, the numbers are still staggering. Google is now up to 88% of market share in search. Crazy. So like other competitors also lost ground. It doesn't feel doable for anyone to dent that. Yeah. I think what you just spoke to is how hard it's going to be for even ChatGPT I'm not going to lie. I use ChatGPT to search for something this weekend, but it feels like a very different experience. A lot of the stuff that I Google, I feel like is health related and I always want to see the source. Have you guys used ChatGPT to search? I guess that's kind of like the secondary question here is, could ChatGPT end up taking over search from Google? I'm sure it can. This is like a very bad idea to be on the record doubting ChatGPT in any way. It feels like we're all going to lose if we do that. Not surprisingly, doing this job, a lot of my searching is tied to things that are current events and I'm not getting good answers through chat GPT. So maybe someday it'll go better for me. But as of now, it's hard to imagine not being a Google man. Sarah, what about you? Are you using chat GPT to search for stuff? I totally agree with Ben. I think it's not reliable enough to use currently for search. I use it for really specific use cases that aren't dependent on timeliness. I do think ultimately it will get there, but just not yet. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Staying on the Google and AI train, Google alleges a Vietnam-based group set up a malware-infested barred clone to dupe people out of their passwords. Google's lawsuit claims it sent over 300 takedown requests to no avail. Boeing is cleaning up the Dubai Air Show right after the United Arab Emirates flagship airline placed a $52 billion order for 95 new Boeing aircraft. Another 30-plane order worth $11 billion came in from low-cost carrier Fly Dubai. Lots of flying out that way. A little ripple effect in the world of retail following Party City's bankruptcy, balloon maker Anagram has also filed for Chapter 11. Party City, with which Anagram shared IP licenses, made up 38% of the company's sales. Bummer there for partiers everywhere. Lastly, in the world of baby stuff, it's just way too expensive. Dior just launched high-end scented water for babies as part of its Baby Dior skincare line, along with the $230 fragrance. You heard that correctly. The line includes a $115 baby moisturizer and a cleaning foam that rings in at $95. Ben and Sarah, I know you do not have babies. I do. And I can tell you, I will not be buying this stuff. But would you guys, if you did have babies? This makes me maybe want to be a baby because it sounds like they're being (laughs) really well taken care of. This is wild. And it's actually way more expensive than even the adult scents, which come in at around 160, which is already very expensive for perfume. I can only imagine there's a really specific buyer for this. 
yeah, I kind of can't fathom spending $230 on scented water for myself or for (laughs) anyone, let alone a child who's maybe not going to like really appreciate. Yeah. Like we're talking hints of pear and wild rose in this (laughs) thing. Like I want that to be appreciated. Yeah. No baby is appreciating that at all. They're just going to keep eating and pooping. And that's really all there is to it. Okay, on to the main story. When I think about summer camp, I think of kind of silly, goofy, nonsensical summer camps that just kind of gave kids a place to go and goof off and meet summer friends. And now it seems like summer camps are getting a little bit more serious and they're starting to align with this new trend that we've seen over the last probably five to 10 years, which is that all kids want to do these days is become influencers and content creators. And now there are camps that are popping up to help them do exactly that. Sarah, you went super deep on this. What is going on here? Camp is looking a little differently today. Like gone are the days of archery and ceramics. Kids want to be content creators and YouTubers. So according to a 2019 survey, nearly 30% of kids ages 8 to 12 said that their top career choice was YouTuber. So to meet that demand, camps are popping up that cater to that, which means teaching kids how to make videos, become creators, and ultimately get famous on the internet, which we can talk about later is its own double-edged sword. But there's a Texas-based camp called Creator Camp. It's a summer program for children ages 6 to 13, and it offers programming around YouTube, Minecraft modding, creative AI, filmmaking, like basically everything that's popular with kids on the internet right now. And there's a bunch of other camps springing up across the country that have similar programs. And Ultimately, it just teaches kids how to shoot, edit, brand YouTube videos. And I believe many of these, it's up to the parents' discretion whether or not they put these channels public. For camp, they're mostly private. So no concerns there. But the goal is to become famous. So this is crazy to me. I think the bigger question in my head is, is this a good thing? Is it good that kids want to be YouTubers, want to be creators? And I think it's a harder question than I used to think it was. I think the first survey that showed like how much kids wanted to be YouTubers came out like five-ish years ago or something like that. Like at that point, there were just these kind of scattered few influencers that really owned the space. I think the Paul brothers were blowing up at that point. And and there were some others that I think were probably getting these kids super excited about it. My thoughts on it have changed a little bit because I do think that the creator economy is showing that there's a lot of different niches that people can explore. Kids aren't just learning how to be the hosts of their own YouTube channel. They're learning videography. They're learning Minecraft modding. They're learning all of these things that aren't just on-air talent type skills, right? And I think like that's one of the biggest things that I'm curious about is like how many of these kids want to be the star of their YouTube series or how many of them are interested in some of those kind of ancillary roles there? Because I think that could actually be pretty interesting. You know, obviously, selfishly, I'm coming at it from the angle of I'm going to like run into an eight-year-old and they're going to rip me apart from my podcasting abilities right now. And that's really hard to deal with emotionally. But I think you hit on the head where transferable skills are really important in all of this. And I suppose if these programs are going deeper enough into, I think one that you cited, Sarah, kind of has a lot of AI applications, that's probably going to really be helpful for kids in the long run being comfortable in that space. So there are positives here. I do worry that like if you look at the wider trend, that the fame component always looms large in influencer talks. 54% of people aged 13 to 38 in the U.S. said they want to become influencers. And so I just feel like there is a larger cultural shift right now toward you want to be front center. You want to be the face of the Internet. That feels really damaging. That's a really scary thing to aspire to from a young age. You are losing a lot of privacy. Yeah. But I don't know, Sarah, what are you thinking? I mean, as you mentioned, this isn't just about kids. We're seeing this play out even in higher education. Places like Cornell, UCLA, USC have all added content creation and social media marketing courses to their programming because this is something that adults want for their careers as well. I would say 
in defense of the influencers. At the end of the day, there is a lot of entrepreneurship happening when you are an influencer full-time professionally. I think there's an argument for that, learning how to build a small business and being kind of a one-man operation where you're both the creator and the marketer. So I think there is a way in which this isn't completely horrible for the youth of the future. I think that it's just you have to be careful with privacy concerns and kids, obviously. But outside of that, I think that there's also something to be learned for being an entrepreneur and just great creativity and skills that could come from this. So we'll see, I guess, as they age. I agree. I think back when I first started hearing about this, being a YouTuber didn't really seem like a career that had craft to it, right? And now I think it does. The thing that I worry about now is that old quote, like comparison is the thief of joy, right? So if like everybody is trying to become a YouTuber, you start becoming obsessed with growth. You start seeing these people that are doing similar things to you growing faster than you. And there's kind of a mental health thing that I think goes with that that can be really, really negative that kind of mirrors the stuff that was going on on Instagram with teenage young women. When I was younger, I made like really, and I I mean, like I cannot emphasize dumb enough in this, really dumb videos with my friends. And that was great. The audience was just my friends. And it was great to pick up those skills. I'm really glad I got to do that. It horrifies me to think of living in an era where that's not just for my friend, that's for the entire internet. And so, I don't know, I think that's the part that scares me is how wide the scope goes with the work that kids are doing in here. If it's very insular and they're learning a lot and testing boundaries and all these different things, I think that's great if they're you know, really opening themselves up to kind of all the mental health challenges that Rob, you're talking about then, uh (laughs) uh-oh, this could be really damaging. That said, I do want to see the videos of the kids with their $230 scented water. Yes. Like, what is their upbringing like? I do have one more thought here. The amount of time that kids spend on YouTube now is outrageous. The numbers are completely mind-blowing if you look at it. And it's like over six hours a day or something on average. It's like kids literally live on YouTube. I feel like when I was growing up, there was a huge stigma around video games. But then it was like a lot of the kids that were really good at video games, ended up getting really into computers and ended up getting really good at coding and engineering. And it's like, is this kind of like the parallel to that for our generation where like these kids are going to get super into the creator economy and maybe down the road, this is just like the new entertainment spectrum. So it's interesting to see where this could go. All right, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning into the Hustle Daily Show. We are a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We have got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email. Have a terrific Tuesday and we will see you tomorrow. I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Puri. My First Million features famous guests like Alice Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern, went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire, thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.